The Torpedo Factory Art Center is located in the historic section of Alexandria, Virginia, on the Potomac River, near the foot of King Street. Alexandria was and still is a seaport for the nation's capital. artists work, exhibit, and sell their art to the torpedo factories. Work displayed in the studio has all been created here. This is my studio. I'm a sculptor. And everything that you see here is sort of a type of sculpture. Even if it's totally three-dimensional, like this piece here. This, this is a black Belgian marble sculpture. It's, it's a very interesting form because it has two backs. And uh, the part that attracts people very much, of course, is the most uh, pinchable part. But, uh, but the part that I like best is uh, all the muscles that I had to invent between these two bodies that, that meet in a very uncharacteristic way. It's very tactile. You can see that I started working on wax and uh, you can see how the movement and the force of the, of the hand has shaped the piece. And this is a, a sculpture that um, is rather sensuous and very simple and fun. And then I, the pieces on the wall are made of cast paper, pure handmade paper pulp. The, the work is done first in clay and then I take a mold and throw away the clay and inside the mold I press the paper pulp. Um, some of these pieces are body cast and some are created uh, like that. And this is a fountain. Uh, this fountain is made with the idea of um, having the marble float on water, a very simple and kind of zen concept. Um, it's very soothing to see that the water ripples and the sound that it makes. And this is an indoor fountain. And, uh, then I work with wax again, and uh, then the wax becomes cast into bronze. And this is a piece that represents vaguely, vaguely, uh, a swimmer. And his arms have become like fins, and his body um, has become like a wave. Can you see it? It's very abstract, it's very, it's very simple again. I think that when sculpture is simple, uh, you, can, you never get tired of, of seeing it and experiencing it. This is uh, uh, a piece that has won first prize in a sculpture show. It's a very thin piece of marble that presented a lot of uh, technical difficulties because what can you do when a piece is so thin? And so I made a face that emerges from it. Now we are going to see some other artist studios. The next one is going to be Pat Monk. He's next door. Just in time. Good. What are you doing? You're making so much noise. What Actually, are you creating? Actually, I'm making a standard yeah. for our American flag. But I just finished sawing this. But oh, yeah. 
Yes. Uh, Pat, one of the pieces that I absolutely go crazy about is this carving that you have done. This is the most complex piece I've ever seen. Tell, tell me something about this. Oh, this is a piece that's very popular with the public when they come in. They always ask at first, what is it? And then they start seeing various little parts in it. Actually, what it is, it's an old oak stump that, that floated down the torpedo factory out on the dock when, before the dock was rebuilt. We threw a grappling hook on it and towed it around to the shore and rolled it up. And, but we had to let it dry for about a year. And the way I did it was just stand around, sit around, and look at it until something showed up. The first one was this uh, bat, which you see on the side down here like yes, that. Yes. And it represents the origin of life in the sea. People are always flabbergasted that it really had this shape. For example, I didn't cut any of these holes, and I didn't add any wood. It's all one piece. See the old man of the sea here. He's supporting the whole thing, but you know, yeah. he's actually got water wings on. Most people don't notice that. Because, no. you know, it'd be impossible to support the whole universe without water wings, right? <laughs> yeah. Here now, here's his face even a little clearer with a nose. Yeah. And you notice this decayed. little frog here? Oh, yeah. yeah this, I mean, yes. That's a decayed face. But oh. this one is an eagle that's caught hold of the frog, which is sitting on a lily. But then this hawk has captured the eagle. Oh, it's a wonderful piece. Right. It's a and, one, uh, I like this person here. This, this well, this piece, person up here is being crucified, and this yeah. is um, a cultist that's after him. See his big foot here and uh -huh. another foot here? Uh, it's one and actually, they're piece. all interlaced in the story, uh, yeah. in the story uh, thematically, too. And the bull, of course, representing a lot of ancient religions. It was very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mythological. Uh, I, it's not bore. for sale, right? You know, your wife will never allow Come you on to now. sell it. In an artist studio, everything is for sale. <laughs> 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 but this one has taken a long time to do. And then you do pieces like the welded. Uh, yeah, I do do welded steel. Yeah. Now you can see some of it. The welded steel is very impressive. It's very modern looking. And well, it's actually, totally I different. Uh, it looks as if many it's years ago I started yeah. out in just wood, small yeah. wood. But in 1970, I opened a studio and bought a lot of equipment for doing welding, marble and soapstone, plaster, and a lot of the larger things because I was getting more ambitious. Yes. And uh, now I have this studio. I'm able to work in uh, metal as well as right. stone. But your background is a, a physicist. You yeah, a before physicist. that I was in. Yeah. I was running a technical business that uh, had, a, and I had a physicist background. But in college, I studied yeah. all the art they had at oh, school. Yes. Yeah. Pat, all the visitors that come through your studio, how do they react? What do they? Well, you know, I have a large variety of types of things, so I get a lot of different rea reactions. Some humorous and some um, serious. Yes, I know, I know. And sometimes uh, uh, they are looking and they are not seeing what we see. Yeah, and that's then, some of it. But on yeah. the other hand, you get a lot of satisfaction of the people that come in and uh, maybe it's the first time they've been exposed to this type of sculpture or something. Yes. Yeah. And the real thrill is when you have a, when you sell a piece, to a young couple you know can't afford it, but they're sacrificing something to start their house out and get a little piece of art. It makes you feel good. Yes. Yes, it, it does. It does. small pieces but they never quite have the feel I'm after and I don't enjoy the doing as much because I like to really get into it. I usually don't pre-plan the work I let it happen and if, if something shows up that's recognizable it wasn't necessarily my intent but it's okay. <laughs> How are you? Hello, Amarillo. How are you? 
It's wonderful to see you. I hate to interrupt this beautiful You came at, You came work. at a good time. I'm good. just ready to sign the last one oh, of them. You know how long I've been working on oh, these. Oh, these are wonderful yeah, you, 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 came, you came for the yes, celebration. Yes, isn't it? Yeah. This is the harvest. This, this, <laughs> when, I, when I sign them, yes. that's it. Oh, that, what a joy to see it. And this, when yes. I get this on there, yes. the pair are done. Yes. Oh, well, they're not done because no. they, have, they have to be matted because and framed and everything. Because you're going to them and frame them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, they're very contemporary and yet they're dramatic. Oh. They have a traditional look to them. Yes, I'm pleased yes. with them oh. because it's. I've done this iris from her garden every year now for a long time, and they're getting better. Each, each they're, year, yes, each yeah. year they're different. Each year yes. they, they say something different to me. Oh, but this is so velvety, mm -hmm. and they, they feel they are jumping out of the canvas. It's no, like I'm, a top I'm, I'm very pleased with it. I really oh, am. Zeta, you have had such an exciting life. Your life has well, been <laughs> so full of, uh, of uh, pinnacles. I mean, you have been an, an actress and a model, and you have had uh, uh, such mm. a, an impressive military career. And, and then, as an artist, you have, become, you have found, really, uh, well, Marilla, I've always been an artist. Yes, really. I was an really. artist as a kid in school. Really, uh, yes. But being an artist and working in it are two different things. I know, I know. But if you hang around long enough, you're going to do a lot of things, and you'll finally get to do exactly what you want to do, which is paint. And that's what I've been doing now for over 20 years, is just painting. Oh, I've been painting all my life. You have made a lot of people happy with your work. I, mean, I hope so, because people, that's, that's what it's all about, yes, really, you know. Yes. It's, uh, uh, they make a statement, but it's your environment and what you feel. And when people come back and say, boy, that painting just makes me feel yeah. so good. Or the color just brings me to life. I love it. Yeah. That's the good part. Yeah. I've gone the whole gamut, just like you have. Yeah. I've gone yeah. portraits, figurative, yeah. uh, still life, semi-abstracts, oils, casein, watercolor. <laughs> but when the yeah. fresh flowers are blooming and somebody yeah. brings me a lot of flowers, Oh boy, that's that's it. I'm painting flowers, and usually in watercolor, because I can pull out a piece of paper, get started, yeah. and it's uh, and then let the design grow as it goes. But you you apply uh, a very light um, uh, pigment at first, and yes. then you build that's up. That's right. On, uh, yes. For instance, yeah. on this, uh, these were no darker than this to start Wait, with. Oh, then yes. see, I start building the design, and then. Uh, Actually, all that paint on there is the same mixture of paint. And it's just a different... Same intensity, only a different quantity of, it's, of pigment. Is it's, it? That's right, and just oh. keep building and adding it and letting it grow. So first you make a very loose sketch. Right, uh, be before the flowers yes. all die. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. that's right. Yes. <laughs> but my yeah. fridge is usually yeah. full. I've got peonies in there right now oh. waiting to be painted. <laughs> I don't paint with the idea of entering a show. I paint because I love to do what I'm doing and I've been inspired by the flowers or either I have a commission for, for something. Yes, yes. And if it happens to turn out that I think I've got something good, then I enter shows. Yes. Well, uh, you would hate to lose them, I'm sure. Well, I, I don't if somebody gets them that can really enjoy them. Yes. You know, when you've had a painting around for a while, it's been in a few shows and it's won a few awards, you feel good about it. And then somebody comes in and buys it, which is the important thing, yes. and then really wants it, really enjoys it. It's, yes. uh, it's, it's fine. And you know, irises are the favorite of almost yes. everybody. Yes. You know, uh, do you have any work of when you were a little kid? Have you ever saved? Has anyone saved I have for one you? painting yeah. that I did, oh, in the early 30s, yeah. that my sister had, and it's not bad. It's not remember, good, but it's not bad. Uh, but no, I don't have. When I was a kid in school, if we were having a class and something needed to be illust illustrated, the teacher would have me to write it, yes. you know, on the on the board and then draw the illustration. Yes. And when the class is over, she would erase it, and it would break my heart. I loved it. Oh, did you? But, uh, can you tell us something uh, about your your very uh, splendid career? I had an exciting army career, I must say. It covered 25 years, and it was during those eventful times. I was World War II. Korea and Vietnam. And I came in the Army as an auxiliary. We weren't even Army yet. We were an auxiliary corps. Yes. I was always in journalism, public information, 
Normally I was the photo officer or I was in television or I was in radio or something like that. Or I was protocol. Well, I was in Korea with Big Switch and Little Switch. You know, that's the exchange of our prisoners. I was there for the armistice. And you see, the reason that I was there, because I was in charge of all the photographers and did all the photographs. And then I came back here. I was in Berlin when the wall went up. But I came back, I came back here and I got a job I didn't know anything about. I went to the Hill as congressional coordinator, and I'm not a lawyer. And uh, when I went up there, why, well, there was no such job, and the job was made for me. And I think if I gave anything to the Army that I'm really proud of, I was fairly instrumental in getting the legislation passed so that women in the Army today could be general officers. Because, see, I was a lieutenant colonel. I couldn't go any higher. And that was as high as a woman could go, unless she was director yeah. of the court, and then she would yes, run it back. I see. But we have a lot of generals now. Oh, and, uh, okay. uh, and it was fun. It was fun. It's a joy to see you again. Oh, bye Marilla, bye. thank you for coming in. Bye bye. And thanks for liking my paintings. I love your paintings. I can't. Well, I can't wait to get them mad and oh, framed. Okay. I think they're going to be great. I know, indeed. Bye bye. At least, at least as great as anything I can come up with. Oh, which is wonderful. Bye bye. Thanks, Marilla. <laughs> bye bye. Torpedo Factory. Tell us a little bit about how it came about. Well, back in the early 1970s, the Art League that I was president of was up on Cameron Street, and it was about to lose its lease. And I think I had looked in every pigeon loft, literally in Alexandria, for space, and I was very distressed uh, that it it looked like we were going to be have to leave town, you know, because there simply was not space and at a reasonable price. I was also, uh, at that point, the staff of the Alexandria Bicentennial Commission, and I was bemoaning the problems one afternoon uh, sitting in the Bicentennial office, and the chairman of the commission at that time was Jim Coldsmith. And he's, I said that I thought artists would be priced out of Old Town within five years, and he said, well, what about the torpedo factory? The city doesn't know what to do with it. Uh -huh. And I went away and put together the concept of having studios, working studios that the public could actually look into and see the artist working, and galleries, more jury show galleries other than just the art leagues, and having the school there too. And, I, and uh, what happened is, is that the, the artist went in and started cleaning up this building. Now you realize that it had been used for many years for storage of everything for the federal government happened to have. That first was a, a, a truly a torpedo factory. Oh yes, before In first world war. First world war. Uh -huh. first, second world war. It was a uh -huh. torpedo plant, and then immediately after the war, the Nazi war records were brought there and studied by historians from all over the world. I see. And then when they left, then uh, the, the government furniture and odd facts for the Smithsonian and uh -huh. as I say the White House stores and other things were yeah. stored here until the buildings were sold to the yeah. city. And this process went on quite a long time, but really we opened in the fall of 74 after getting approval, like in late April. 
yeah. committee meetings? No, no committee meetings, no. <laughs> no. We just sort of ad hoc it and we oh, developed it as we went along and it, it worked. And frankly, the city didn't know anything about uh, how to run an art center. They'd never run one before. There hadn't been one like this before. Were they a little suspicious that artists would not, uh, for instance, pay the rent? Or? Oh, yes. I can really <laughs> remember that the finance officer of the city told me a month or so after we opened, and I was the director of the arts yeah. at that point, that he was so surprised to get all those first month rent checks. I think people have this view of artists sometimes, it's what I call the Van Gogh ear syndrome. Yes. That we're all slightly crazy and irresponsible. Yes. No one who's, who's not an artist knows how important it is to have a studio space for an artist away from their homes, away from their garages. It's important sure. to, to just go out of context and become something else and for that period. And, oh, uh, that's but so also uh, the Torpedo Factory Art Center also helps all the visitors who come in. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. This was part of the um, original idea was that it was to be a major educational institution and basically help bring Lower Old Town back to life, which it did help do. That people would come in, they would see artists working, they'd have a greater appreciation and understanding for what was going on, yeah. and if they don't perhaps ever buy from that artist, someday they're going to buy from some artists because they understand the process and a bit yeah. better. We want to push these ribs in a little bit. We can, and we'll shape it again. So, you know, it's not, it's not exactly what the way it's going to be. But you can at least see more what you've got. And it gives you a better idea of what you need to do. Okay, that's good. You're going to need to, as soon as you can, we'll stick another rib in here. But obviously, you can't do that until you've woven this side. All right. Your basket's really big here. Let me say, give maybe two rows, include these into the weaving, and then push it apart and put two more ribs in. Um, and you may even be able to do the same thing up here. Uh, I think what I want you to do is add, do you remember how I showed someone else how you put one rib on each side here? Okay, um, weave two rows, add the two ribs in here, um, and then uh, add one rib in on each side here as if this were the backbone. See on here, you added two ribs in. crochet and um, this this is uh, something I've been working on is this um, handbag and I don't know how to crochet by a pattern I just make everything up as I go and it's a lot of fun to do it that way lay the color on the fabric while it's damp and what happens is you have a slight immersion of colors coming, running into each other, but not quite meeting. And then once they dry, I steam them, and the piece stays exactly like this. Hi, Joyce. Thank Hello. you for coming. Hi, how are you? <laughs> it's a joy to be here. I like the title of this show. Taken for granted. Taken for granted. Thank These are uh, forms which are very light. They are made in styrofoam with, uh, with everything on it. There are some uh, surfaces that are they are very reflective. 
right. but that one uh, seems like a, a water reflection. Is that what you had in mind? That's exactly what I had in mind. If I could have gotten a motor up there and made it ripple, it would have been great. Um, I was in Germany and I saw, they have a lot of waterways in their cities, and I saw a water reflection one afternoon under an arched bridge and I, and things like that just really turn me on my work and I kind of store them back in my mind, you know, for, yes. for future ideas. And then they wake you up at night, right? right? At right. night you yeah. read them. I do. <laughs> Sometimes all night. Yeah. Yeah. I love using um, the metallic papers uh, because to me the, the world does sparkle even when you look out in the street, you know, driving along you see little sparkles in the road and, and of course in the water. And I like these little hidden surprises, and people uh, can Smart find them as they look. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this concept, believe it or not, I think got started when I went to Italy in '84. Um, I don't often come back. It seems like it takes a while for the ideas to set in my head and then come out in an art form. Um, I saw the frescoes, and in Italy, it, uh, they will patch, uh, the people there seem to patch things over things that have been there for years and years and years, therefore, you know, that layering effect, which of course I like to do in, in my work a lot, and that uh, ancient look from that period of time has definitely been an influence. Yes. And my other influence, as far as color goes, has been the American Southwest out yeah. in the Grand Canyons. Yeah. I, I like rock. <laughs> It isn't that you physically took photographs of these no, pieces no, and these places. It's, it's the emotion that, that that's made you it. feel. That's it. It's mostly what I felt and what's, what gets stored in the head yes. and then what comes flying out, heaven yes. only knows when. Uh, Joyce, yes. tell me again, uh, how, if it's not too much of a secret to divulge to everybody, how you make these pieces? What do you use as, as ground, as sculpture? Um, the underneath, the, yes. the armature, is a very dense styrofoam. And I carve, carve this out and assemble it. And uh, I'm using, I use cheesecloth on it. Uh, I use paper mache. I use metallic uh, paper chips, uh, metallic papers. And uh, everything is crafted so beautifully. I mean, well, I wish you all yes. the luck in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are so gifted. Ciao. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. On the first floor at the torpedo factory in front of a uh, um, spiral staircase which has been a sculptural project for us. Uh, there are many different uh, artwork as you ascend the staircase. Uh, the first one is done by Myrne Kelleher. She has done a sculpture in painted wood dedicated to children or as she says a very short people and uh, it's painted wood. The next one is uh, Pat Mant, uh, cast uh, hydrostone and it's an experiment in, um, about uh, cloning, same repetition of uh, torsos. And this is the work of uh, Brian McCall, 
Uh, it's etched plexiglass. This is mine and this is made out of uh, um, a tapa cloth which has been fiberglass. The title of this piece is Just Looking and it's a simple commentary to all the people that come to visit us at the factory. Next piece is made by Joyce Zippler and it's a mixed media with gauze and cotton. And then Mark Anderson has made a piece with um, uh, stained glass. And Betty Symes has made one with cast concrete. All these people are ascending the staircase. I don't know if you noticed, they're, they're all connected with this project. Each, each artist has worked in a different medium, in a different expression, but somehow it all comes together. I that in Austria. You do many different uh, type of engraving in glass. Well, there are, like what I've done now yes. is I've used a stone wheel yes. or then yeah. a diamond wheel and then yes. I go back to a carbide wheel to get different yes. colors out. Ah. Uh, this is a copper wheel engraving. Ah. And what I do is I dig ah. it in. Yes. I dig in with a diamond wheel or a carbide yes. wheel, then I draw in all the details and go back in with other copper wheels. I brought one here to show. It's a copper wheel. Uh, they have to be mounted on and they have to run nicely and smooth. Thank you so much, Gerda. Oh, Bye -bye. you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. This work is Sideshow. As a, as a young person and a child growing up in the South, I used to have a, an awful lot of summers going to the carnivals and fairs that came around and saw a lot of uh, pretty strong sideshows and carnival shows, which really must have impressed me deeply because I'm still working off the fascination that developed at that time. The image itself is representing as if you were coming up to the front of an exhibition and saw the people gathering in front to attract you in. In the background at the top is this, what is called flash, which is a series of tattoo patterns to attract the customer. And of course, the stripper, tattooed man, and rather strange looking clown. As Lon Chaney said, there's nothing funny about a clown in the moonlight. And the kind of prints that I make are basically what they're called is intaglio etchings. And what I'm doing now is this is called a burnisher. I uh, have the tools that you have here. This tool right. here is yes. a burnisher. This they're, tool here yes. is a scraper. And, and I have etched this plate extensively over a period of, say, five or six different acid baths. And now I'm taking out some of the lines that I don't particularly want 
ah. it to be quite so dark. So I'm ha physically having to cut them away and then polish the plate with this hand tool. It's a lot of hand labor involved. And it, so uh, you, can, you can uh, continue making changes in your plate, or you can add or, uh, or obliterate. It depends how well, the first printing has come out. The, the copper is a very living kind of material. You can always keep adding, subtracting, putting things in, making a gradation in the tone that you have, you see. Mm -hmm. You're not limited to like the acid bite itself. Once you get it out of the acid, a tremendous amount of time is spent for me to manipulate what I have done to the plate. Oh. And so this, this because takes... Because the deeper the groove, the darker the color. That's right. Yes. And, it, and the, the beauty of copper mm -hmm. for etching for me is that it is so sensitive. You can have oh. the most whispery, feathery kind of tone to the deepest, heaviest oh. kind of tone you can imagine, oh. all from the same piece of material. Oh. You, see. Yes. you print it what they call states as you're going along. Okay. So you'll work on the plate a while to get to the point where you feel like you've done as much as you can conceive and you mm -hmm. can visually see. Yes. And then I take, I ink the plate and then you wipe off the surface ink and all the little marks, mm -hmm. any little agitation in the metal will hold ink and then that's what you print. I love the word agitation. It yeah, sounds so it's, sensitive. It's, it's yes. so sensitive, yes. that's right. Yeah. And so you print it several times like in different states of, of process. Yes. until you get to the final finished piece when you say this is the way ah. the best I can get out of this idea. Yes. Well, this is my wife and oh, what I did is beautiful. I posed her at home and I took yeah. a photograph, right. just a little three by five snap and I ah. brought it down here and I did an elaborate drawing like the drawing she'll probably be yes. showing. Yes. And I worked the drawing out which in itself I did as a finished piece and then I, I made the plate but once you start the plate, this is being the plate yeah. of course, yeah. I get the drawing out of the way. Right. I don't try to reproduce the drawing no. on the metal. No. Now th this is a combination of Japanese watercolor, yes. sumi ink, India ink, and pencil. On the, it's actually on etching paper. Right. I'm using a gray etching paper. When I first started, I, I was so I was enamored with the delicate tones of the water. And then when I tried to get them in the copper, I could get them, yeah. but the print didn't sing right, so I had to put the drawing away. I couldn't oh. look at the drawing. I had to finish the print. I could start with the outline, but the print takes over, you see. It's done off the metal. It's not yes. done off the drawing. Oh, yes. This is the, the woman. This is the woman this from, the, is print. The, woman from right. the print. Oh. I'm working with a man that's been tattooing me for the last five years or so that's oh. extremely he must be a great artist. artist. Oh, yeah. my And so I take, goodness. take a lot of my own designs, you oh, see. Oh, my goodness. But he understands them very well. Oh, yes. Well, God. he's really a, really a very talented man. Oh. He loves my works. So I've been able to, like, oh, trade some of my indeed. prints for some of these work. You know, is it true that there is a society of tattoo artists or tattoo people that have tattoos? And Well, in the last 10 or 15 yeah. years, there's been a complete rebirth of the profession. Oh. It's now a profession. The people are involved. There are a lot of people that are college yeah. graduates, people yes. that are yeah. highly technically yes. advanced. It's and not brave. Some, and, and brave, because it must be very yeah. painful. And yeah. I, I, I've been yeah. in the National Tattoo Club for over 10 years. Ah. And, uh, Beautiful. Business card. Oh wow. no! Oh God! You're a clown! Oh my God! And this Japanese geishas, how wonderful! There's my Navy tattoo. When I was in the military. Oh, you were in the, you were a sailor, right? right. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe how beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. My goodness. Oh. <laughs> cellophane and polarized light. The colorless cellophane is cut at different angles for each of the design layers or the collage layers and uh, that explains how the imagery can come and go as the polarizer is rotated. 
once in a while someone will come into my studio and they'll stand in the doorway over here and say, that's marvelous, that's beautiful. And I'll look around and say, which one? Okay. Expecting they're talking about my painting and they'll turn it off and they're looking out the window. And a number of years ago I thought, wouldn't it be great if, uh, if I could come up with an idea for a Christmas stamp? So I did one, uh, was a poinsettia stamp that was issued in 1985. And this is the, uh, the ornament stamp that's behind you here. So uh, I actually brought the ornaments into the uh, studio yeah. and displayed them on a, uh, in, a, in an arrangement, in a setup. I just yeah. hung them and put a, a pine tree bow mm -hmm. around them and, uh, and began to paint. You made a still life out of it. Yeah, I made yeah. a still life yeah. out of it. And the interesting thing is, uh, working with ornaments, is all the reflections that you see in it. It's a mm -hmm. glass globe oh, in color, yes. so it reflects everything in the room. And uh, they reflect, uh, it, would, it yeah. would reflect me. So one of the, uh, another one of the rules in doing this for the Postal mm -hmm. Service is that you can't show on a stamp anyone that hasn't been dead for 25 years. Oh, yeah. So uh, I didn't want to wait. Oh, no. And I wanted to do the stamp, so I had to paint myself out. But I would work and do the thumbnails like this, and then uh, perhaps uh, maybe work a little color into the uh, into the piece. You know, just like you would do yes. any other kind of a yeah. any other kind nice. of a uh, yes. painting. You'd work it out yeah. this way in uh, in your idea yes. stage, and then yeah. uh, then begin to uh, refine it, yeah. along with other things to. Uh, other kinds of commissions that an artist yeah. might get is a commission to uh, illustrate a book. And uh, I had the, uh, the fun of working with uh, Michael, Michael Collins, Collins uh, the astronaut from the Apollo 11 mission. And uh, he, wrote, he uh, wrote this book uh, that it had dealt with the, uh, the whole man flight program. From, there are no photographs book, in the yeah. book and there are 88 illustrations. Oh. And uh, he would write a chapter of the book and then bring oh. it over here to the uh, torpedo factory and we would uh, do little thumbnails like yeah. I showed oh. you uh, a while ago relative to the stamp. The advantage that an, an artist or an illustrator has in working on a book like this is that uh, perhaps there wasn't a photograph of a particular thing in space. An artist could uh, take several things and put them together in a single illustration. He could, like in, in this particular illustration, <clears throat> it shows the Apollo 11 mission of the astronauts landing on the moon. And we have uh, oh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and uh, Mike Collins is in the uh, spacecraft yes. orbiting above the Earth. Now, no photograph could take this picture. There was one camera on the moon at that time yes. and it was on uh, Neil Armstrong. So this commission, which must have been wonderful, must have been really in every way. But then you go to very intimate subjects. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your watercolors are very yeah. personal. Well, you don't see many people in my uh, paintings. A building to me is almost a, like a full-scale still life. I want the viewer to be the only person there. Involved. You know, the only person involved yeah. with the scene. I feel that the robes have a sculptural effect that I want to paint, the, and the pattern that they set up is something I want to paint. But it also allows whoever, who's ever in the robe not to be bound by the way they perceive themselves, so that I can paint them how I perceive them, and how, what comes out in their, their real selves come out when they're wearing the robes, rather than how they perceive themselves and how they present themselves in their clothing. So my yes. procedure is to photograph yeah. yes. and then work from the photographs right. because my yeah. studio is too small oh, to, yes. to uh, work in with a live model and of course kids don't stay still. Yeah. These are my little boy's girlfriends. The, yeah. the one in the middle yeah. is Ginny, who is his yeah. present love. Oh. <laughs> and yes. This and next Alice, yes. no, Alice is his buddy and they play football oh. together. Oh. And, you know, it's fun to get the kids here to do this with me because I get them to come out of themselves and they play.
doing a wood block print. Yes. And it's done with the technique of a jigsaw puzzle, as you will see when I put it in the block, combined with the traditional Japanese wood block printing of doing one block, printing it, then layering it one. So first you make a drawing and then you Right, actually, and I usually draw yes. right on the block. Yes, right. And then you go with the jigsaw. Yes. I then put the paper on. felt yeah. and you run it through for every single print and every time you do a print it has to yeah. be inked all over yes. again yes so here we go and that's what the finished print looks like oh that's fantastic now so, there is orange that goes in here but i yeah. do that by hand uh, yes so you don't have this problem of exact registration that you will have if you print in each each puzzle separately that's right. Yeah. You're never quite right. sure yes. how each one is going to work. Right. Um, so this, some get discarded, yeah. some are keepers. This, this, for instance, is a very successful piece. Right. This is the, the, the finished product that yes. you have. You have. This is the same bottom. Yeah. But it right. also gets printed sometimes with a separate top. Right. It, but it's printed right in this case. This, this comes out yes. and all those little pieces yeah. go in. Oh, the one thing that is, is really exciting is that the Library of Congress has purchased three of your works. Right. I mean, you did not have to donate it. No. <laughs> they paid you for it. That's <laughs> wonderful. This is about your apples. I right. This is a series of apple prints. Yes. You, you have uh, you have made them also on this size for the book. Oh yes. We These are all original woodcuts. Oh, yes. uh, this one was done oh. in a very large piece. Yes. Uh, as uh, well. But these are all piece. individual oh, woodcuts. Wonderful. doing an article for uh, photographic magazine Peterson's Photographic that is uh, they want to cover the uh, all the grain techniques that I'm known for and the uh, the impressionist painting movement was a complete reaction and spin-off of the, uh, the early naturalist photography movements and the uh, there was a you know the first impressionist exhibit of course was held in a photographer's studio because the Beaux Arts salons uh, refused to show their work. Impressionism painting was called the photographic style of painting because they painted bits and pieces and fragments of life and that's something that one learned from the camera. Uh, the, the camera taught the artist that you could only see only a limited area in focus. You could only focus on one image or one person at a time uh, and that the uh, you know, the photographs that you, people, you see, like a snapshot that has everything in focus, we don't see like that. That's right. Everything I do is strictly photographic in nature, though. I don't use special effects, airbrushing, graphics effects, digital matrixing, you know, computer graphics, whatever. So it means uh, that I generally never use anything the way the manufacturer intended it to be used. Oh. I, want to, I want the camera to produce the image that I see in my mind. I don't want to record and document data uh, as a Kodak or Ilford has. So basically, what I've always done with the uh, with the nudes, I try to get as much of the individual involved and as much of their personality on paper as possible. Every particular woman has different uh, different things, uh, different nuances, things that make them special. And it's a question of trying to focus on that instead of trying to go for the standard glamour or whatever is considered the regular way that you should show somebody and that's hard on people a lot of women are very beautiful but they are not photogenic or they are not um, the you know the uh, cover girl look or whatever the play. I, I like the fact that the women that are more unusual I like women I work with women that are 25 pounds under or overweight that doesn't make any difference you can add weight with the camera huh. you can take it off
brass powders. They've been used since very ancient times on metal, uh, either copper or steel or something else, but generally on copper. And uh, they're fired to 1,500 degrees in the kiln, and at that point they adhere to the surface, and it becomes a glass surface. Some are opaque, some are transparent. They look like just ground sand. Uh, they're sifted onto the surface, as I'll show you. The colors do not look at all like they're going to fire. You have to anticipate how they're going to fire. And I particularly like a lot of transparent layers because then yes. you get the, uh, the multiple effects. And of course, this is totally uh, weatherproof. weatherproof. Yeah, I take a brush or th my finger and oh, yes. rub it out just oh, a little yes. bit. Yes. Yes. Uh, I then would take a transparent, it looks like it's white, yeah, yeah. but it's not really white, it's, it, mm -hmm. it fires transparent. Mm -hmm. And I will go over the entire surface with it. No. It simply keeps this from burning off oh, while that course. is burning on. Oh, of course, that and was so the next question. The, right. oh. One of the problems with enamels is that every firing you gain something and you lose something. Oh. I will put the whole enamel flat on this and I will, you'll have to stand back yeah, in just a I second. Can help you. No, yes. see, it'll go on like this. I'll have to keep it perfectly flat because right. of the enamel. And I will take it over to the kiln. Oh, and if you'll yes. open the door there, oh, I'll right, show yes. how we would come in. Actually, okay. from this angle, it'll be a little difficult here today. But, but it will actually go into the kiln on this fork and then be fired. I am only surprised at how reasonably priced your work is, mm -hmm. considering what expensive material you're dealing with. Uh, well, I like to produce, I suppose, yes. and at the prices yes. that I put them, yes. they do sell fairly quickly to yes. average people. Yes, right. Uh, right. Which is. Um, yes. Which is nice, and I guess one of the nice things about the Tapita factory as a whole is that the people can come in and find things because uh, yeah. they're buying directly from yeah. the artist somewhat That's more right. reasonably than yes. they might in a gallery which has to support the gallery. Marian, tell us something about your political career which has been so brilliant. And well, I guess I've always been interested in public affairs and politics. In fact, my education was not in art. I mean, I had art classes, but my, my undergraduate degree and my master's were political science, you know, so I had been in it a long time. But what really launched me locally here was the Tapita Factory. And to protect it, I got involved in politics initially. I won the state delegate uh, position and have been there through five elections I since. Know, I, know. <laughs> I represent, of course, the eastern half of the city. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's two different thought processes, the art and that. And, and one is relaxation to the other. I can't, I, it's I, very important for me to keep this escape hatch. Yes. And I don't have a telephone here in the studio. Yeah. Oh, don't you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> so when, yes. I, when I'm here, I'm purely with the people that come in yes. to see the artwork yeah, or to, and to work. visited 
with only a few of the 150 artists at the Torpedo Factory. All of them are professionals. Many of them show in galleries and museums throughout the world. You can come and visit them as we have done.